सर वी कैन स्टार्ट सर गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम फॉर टूडेज इंटरनेशनल स्पीकर प्रोग्राम ऑफ सोसाइटी फॉर एग्जिमा स्टडीज आई वेलकम ऑल दूंट फैकल्टीज particularly dr mark ko who has joined from singapore sharing his valuable time i also welcome all my colleagues dr not dr rahul dr maitri i am sure the in the process uh, dr rajiv will also be uh, you know joining soon let me tell you very briefly about society for eczema studies society for eczema studies was created on 29th of you know march last year 2022 it was established with a specific motto of knowledge sharing research publication education evoking interest in all types of eczema atopic dermatitis contact dermatitis and other types of eczema in the young dermatologist as well as practitioners now right now we have a strength of more than 150 mixture of senior and junior very dynamic academically faculties across the country and i am very pleased to share that we have 15 top notches in eczema in the world as our international advisory board members professor marko is one of them now let me tell you a bit about why cyclosporin today when everybody is talking about biologics jack inhibitors so why are we, are we looking back two decades you know ago let me tell you friends that in spite of biologics jack inhibitors you will see that in majority of the studies and majority of the presentations people are talking about jack inhibitors biologics to control the disease and in between as a maintenance treatment either cyclosporin and methotrexate and cyclosporin has definite advantage over methotrexate because it is rapid onset of action and it is called its consistency in its efficacy so let us look back to 2022 years ago what has happened with cyclosporin how it has come up and what is the current perspective of cyclosporin and this is all about we will discuss in next 1 hour 20 minutes or so with this i hand over the platform to dr neera gupta to good evening everyone speakers. thank you so much dr sandeep andhar sir for involving us and giving us this wonderful opportunity to be here today and collaborating on this wonderful occasion as you all know that we are in milestone year of cyclosporine journey this year is the 25th year of cyclosporine it got approved in dermatology in 1997 so how many patients might have been benefited the record says one point more than 1.2 lakhs patients who have been benefited from this molecule it has its valid place in armamentorium uh today we, it's a wonderful scientific session we are thankful to dr sandeep pandhar sir and ses society of eczema studies uh for creating this platform for international speaker uh, program so we are honored to have uh thank you dr sandeep pandhar sir everybody knows dr sandeep pand sir he is professor and head department of pediatric dermatology institute of child health kolkata india we have our eminent international speaker today with us dr mark ko he is a dermatologist pediatric dermatologist dermatopathologist and he is visiting consultant at singapore general hospital sangang general hospital and national cancer center welcome to you dr ko we have our esteemed moderator today uh, for the panel discussion dr metri panda she is a professor of institute of medical sciences in some hospital bhubaneswar 
She'll be leading the uh, moderation for the panel discussion. We have our esteemed panelist, Dr. Rajiv Sekri, sir, a senior consultant dermatologist. He practices in Noida. Dr. Anna Anand, senior consultant dermatologist from Chennai, and Dr. Rahul Mahajan, associate professor, PGI Chandigarh. So, with this, I'll hand over to Dr. Sandeep Pandhar again uh, for his deliberation of role of cyclosporine in immunodermatological conditions. Over to you, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Neera for your kind introduction. I hope the screen is visible. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So uh, friends, I shall be talking about my clinical experience with cyclosporine over the last 25 years. It will be basically a case-based discussion and uh, more of pharmacology and uh, immunopathogenesis of diseases and its correlation with the disease uh, with cyclosporine as an efficacious molecule in these conditions will be discussed by my good friend, Professor Marco. So we have divided the topic like that because there was chance of overlap uh, on this particular topic. So I don't have any conflict of interest as far as this presentation is concerned. I have to cover this uh, in 15 minutes time and I promise you that I shall be doing that. Well, uh, cyclosporine, as you can see, the host of conditions where I have used, uh, but I am not going to, uh, you know, name each and every one to save the time. By and large, for majority of the use of cyclosporine has been for atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, alopecia areata, lichen planus, and all the other conditions which you see. Well, this is uh, a consensus article by us, along with our esteemed colleagues who have been working in the field of cyclosporine in Indian Dermatology Online Journal. And uh, if you want to, uh, you know, last year only, if you want to have a detailed insight into the cyclosporine and its various uses in different conditions and all the details, uh, I, I can strongly recommend this article for all of you. Cyclosporine in psoriasis, where, where does it uh, you know, play its role? It can be used either as monotherapy in moderate to severe psoriasis or pustular and erythrodermic psoriasis during flare of psoriasis. It can be used as a combination or as a sequential therapy. The dose is 3 to 5 mg per kg per day and consider the ideal body weight. That is very important. And you have we have two different modality of starting and continuing cyclosporine. Either you start with a low dose and gradually you go high, high up, and that is called step up, or you start with a high dose, gradually you go down. That is called step, step down. In majority of my patients, I use a step up, uh, you know, a, a protocol. You can say 80% of the patients I use step up protocol. A step down protocol. I start with high dose and 20% of the patients I use step up protocol. Why? I'll be happy to share that during the panel discussion. Now the tapering should be done by 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg every three to four weeks, but there is no hard and fast rule. Let me tell you. It can be a chronic regular use or it can be intermittent use. Cyclosporine versus methotrexate. Nowadays, we are talking a lot about uh, you know use of cyclosporine and methotrexate in between biologics, in between uh, you know JAK inhibitors for after some few six uh, five six months. So they are both the molecules are effective, but cyclosporine has proven to be more consistent than methotrexate in various conditions, and uh, its action is definitely much faster. 
I shall share some of my experiences with uh, both children as well as adults about cyclosporin. So here comes the five-year-old boy with psoriatic erythroderma. Look at the child. The child could not go to school for nearly two years. He was not allowed in school. This is the stigma and ostracism a child silently tolerates for all chronic skin diseases. As well as the parents, they suffer from frustration. And when they brought to the child was brought to me, I put the child straight away on cyclosporine after doing all the preliminary baseline investigations. Five milligram per kg per day, and look at after 10 weeks only. There was near clearance. This is another, another child who was referred to me by one of my colleagues in pediatric nephrology. A seven-year-old boy who had nephrotic syndrome and was on oral steroid prednisolone 20 milligram per day and gradually he started developing these and multiple antifungals, oral as well as topical were given thinking that this is a disseminated dermatophytic infection. But we the dermatologists have no difficulty in making a diagnosis that this was a case of generalized pustular psoriasis annular variant. We uh, confirmed by, by histopathology. And uh, I started the child with, again, cyclosporine. As I told at the beginning, when most of the patients, I go by step down, uh, you know, protocol, high dose, then gradually coming down. After 12 weeks, just see the result. It completely cleared. This child also had problem in school, not attending school for nearly one year, not allowed to attend the school because of the complaint by other parents that this child has got probably something infectious disease and they don't want to allow their children to be sitting next to him. It completely cleared. Not only that, my pediatric nephrologist friend was very happy and she said that, uh, you know, she could bring down the steroid dose that time, which she was struggling to do so for quite some time. So cyclosporine not only acted for Generalized pustular psoriasis, it helped in glomerulonephritis, which led to nephrotic syndrome in the child. You can see the marks of stri of giving long continued steroid to this child. So, by and large, cyclosporine in atopic dermatitis, I give 5 milligram per kg per day and then reduce 1 milligram per kg every 3 to 4 weeks. We can use either simultaneously with oral steroid for a period of four to six weeks even. If there are some so bad cases, I had to give both oral steroid and cyclosporine. Then after a few weeks, usually two to three weeks, I stopped steroid gradually and continued on cyclosporine. This is a four-year-old boy with atopic dermatitis for eight to nine months. I look at the you know severity of the disease. And cyclosporine was started. I must say, you, uh, tell you here that the requirement of cyclosporine or dose of cyclosporine in case of psoriasis is slightly higher than in atopic dermatitis by and large. So after eight weeks, look at the change. Now coming to uh, you know few adult patients. This is the forty-year-old lady who had psoriasis for ten years. And generalized pustular psoriasis, when she was brought to my clinic in an ambulance, her general condition was very poor with hepatorenal involvement, very high serum calcium level, severe respiratory distress, septicemia, electrolyte imbalance. And she was admitted in our hospital to the extent that, you know, we had to do uh, a, a central venous catheterization. It was a team of five, six specialties, internist, physicians, nephrologist, me, the dermatologist, who handled this patient, was absolutely sick. And look at the legs of pus in generalized pustular psoriasis. She received many treatment, including IV antibiotics, two antibiotics, and many other things as per suggestions of the critical care expert, as well as physicians and nephrologist, but cyclosporine was one which was consistently going on. Look at the leg, 
the edema of the leg and the you know pustule large pustules which has formed legs of pus actually and uh, basically she was on cyclosporine though later part after initial good recovery we switched over to you know it an arcept and cyclosporine together and she is completely fine now this is an, the story of another lady 36 year old lady a school teacher who had plantar psoriasis for 10 years listen to the history very carefully was unable to walk for at least one year and was off school for eight months. She had severe depression and she had history of suicidal ideation at least on two occasions. So please tell our colleagues in other specialities who nowadays they don't do. Look down upon dermatology, thinking that dermatol saying that dermatology is only skin deep. Tell them that dermatology can be the most tricky situations in many patients. So this was the kind of situation. And you want visible response. Unlike cardiology, patient is having problem. You give medicines, patient feels better. You are never going to look at the heart. The, how it was looking earlier, how it is looking now. There is no scope. In dermatology, the problem is the whatever best you do, even after that, there is some post-inflammatory hypo or hyperpigmentation and patients say, doctor, this disease has not gone completely. Fortunately, in her, we could see the result in eight months time only with cyclosporine, five milligram per kg per day. And after 10 months, it was complete clearance of the soles. She could start her work, gain back her confidence antidepressive medicines were stopped this was a significant milestone in her you know uh, life for quite a good number of you know years as spoken by her only she resumed her school and post treatment follow up of 6 years is uneventful so baseline test for cyclosporine is CBC, ESR, LFT, serum lipid profile, serum electrolytes, chest X-ray in selected cases only when there is family history of pulmonary cox or personal history of pulmonary cox in the past. Check blood pressure regularly even in children also. Monitoring, regular BP check, serum creatinine, electrolytes, lipid profile at four to six weeks. If two to three times liquid profile comes normal, I don't repeat it. I just got, I just do every time CBC and urea creatinine. So optimal dosing and duration is not established for cyclosporine. We have to remember that. It is an individualized experience and expertise. And you have to tailor your treatment according to the patient's disease, need, other comorbidities, and monitoring parameters, both hematological and biochemical parameters. So pharmacokinetics of cy cyclosporine, we have to know reduction of the dose is gradual. However, evidence for all this is lacking. There are a limited number of publications on this. We have to always, you know, do the cost benefit ratio versus and the risk also. So here cyclosporine has an advantage as far as the risk is concerned, but methotrex it is less costlier. That also we have to keep in mind. But cyclosporine works much, much faster. Its preparation available as 100 milligram capsule, 15 milligram, 25 milligram, and cyclosporine syrup is very concentrated. We must remember that this is the only syrup, probably one of the only, one of the few, 100 milligram per one ml. This I always tell whenever I talk about cyclosporine. So the measurement is very, very tricky. And you have to avoid mixing with grapefruit juice. So many, uh, uh, you know, have the misconception uh, that it is grape juice. It is not grape juice. It is a grapefruit juice because it contains biflavonoids which block cyclosporine you know, absorption. Uh, now, the cyclosporine syrup measurement 
is done with cyclosporin syringe, you know, ordinary syringe, or an insulin syringe. You see, the cyclosporin syringe has a limit of 0.5 ml. Below this, there is no marking. For a very small child, we will come to that during panel discussion at what earlier stage cyclosporin can be given. When you have to give, I have given to one month old baby because there was no other option, extensive psoriasis. So for a very small dose calculation, we found that insulin syringe is much more efficacious than and useful than cyclosporin syringe. We published that in the Indian Journal of Pediatric Dermatology a few years back. Very quickly sharing with you some of uh, the experiences. I have two more minutes as I can see. Uh, <clears throat> that this is the nine-year-old girl with extensive alopecia areata for two years. And after one year of therapy of, with cyclosporin, and believe me that most of the children in whom I have treated with high-dose cyclosporin, their hair is being maintained. And there is a long-term protocol, which I shall be more than happy to share during the panel discussion. So far, I have an experience of 17 patients, and uh, this particular study was uh, accepted as an oral presentation and recently ended WCD Singapore. This girl's mother and entire family, including the girl, was devastated with this alopecia totally. And after cyclosporin, after everything else was tried, that time, you know, tofacitinib has not come in the market. After six months, you can see, and after one year, you can see, you can see what happened later on, complete growth of hair. And even now also the child comes to me for checkup once every year. She is absolutely fit and fine with hairs. But not that, you know, it has always, always responded. Here is the child. After nine months, we could hardly grow hairs. Rather, the child developed gingival hyperplasia. Lichen planus by and large leaves behind hyperpigmentation in type 3, 4, 5 skin, Indian skin. But when you treat with cyclosporin, our experience is that even the hyperpigmentation is also taken care of. There are adverse effects, hypertension, hypertrichosis, which is universal when you go beyond six months, it happens, but it resolves also. Gum hyperplasia. But by and large, there is no electrolyte and renal involvement, uh, you know, if you properly monitor. This type of hypertrichosis often bothers the child as well as the parents. But when there is cyclosporine holidays for six months or so, that is exactly how we give, this gradually resolves on their own, mostly. Gum hypertrophy has uh, occurred in few of my patients, mostly because of self-medication and abuse. Look at this 62-year-old uh, male who had extensive psoriasis. And uh, when he was put, off, put on cyclosporine, lesions subsided completely within eight to nine months. But subsequently, he disappeared. It came back to me after 10 years with a complaint of some swelling inside the mouth. And I asked him to open, and this was the picture, gum hyperplasia. Here, one thing you must take notice of, very bad oral and analgene. So this is something which precipitates gram hyperplasia in patients of cyclosporine. So those whom you are treating with cyclosporine must tell them to do the betadine mouthwash four to five times a day, just like each and every oncologist give the same advice for each and every patient they treat with, uh, you know, immunosuppressive and anti-malignancy drugs. This is the bad oral hygiene. So the take-home message, friends, after steroids, cyclosporine is the most useful, prompt in action, consistent, and safe immunosuppressive drug discovered so far. It is, I am telling discovered so far because other molecules are there, but they have to stay, uh, you know, the test of time. They have to pass through the test of time. This is there for 20, 25 years. Other molecules are hardly there for five, six years. It is useful in a wide range of difficult to treat chronic dermatosis in pediatric age group. When judiciously used with proper indication, doses, monitoring, and compliance of the patients, these are very important. It is very safe. 
don't use homeopathic doses of cyclosporin. This is another thing I have seen in many of my colleagues, unfortunately, that cyclosporin is given to an adult 60 kg old person to start with as a 50 milligram per day. It is of no use. Please don't give it. You are unnecessarily only inviting adverse effects. No efficacy. Its only limitation is this cost. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. So now I'll invite, uh, you, know, you know, Professor Dr. Mark Po to start his deliberation. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sandipan. Uh, and thank you for the kind invitation, uh, inviting me to speak at the STS uh, uh, webinar today. I think I spoke once before uh, last year. Okay, yes. so, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be speaking on my experience with cyclosporin. It's a little bit probably of an overlap with uh, Dr. Sandipan's lecture, but I think I'll try and uh, sort of emphasize some of the important points uh, with cyclosporin. So uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, do note that uh, cyclosporin, uh, uh, at least in Singapore, but even in other parts of the world, is used off-label for some of the indications for pediatric patients. So I'll speak on the mechanism of action and pharmacokinetics very briefly, and then some of the indications of cyclosporin in pediatric dermatology and some of my uh, experience with using cyclosporin. And then finally, uh, I'll just uh, just uh, reiterate about the side effects, contraindications, and monitoring. Uh, so um, cyclosporin is actually a peptide that's isolated from soil fungus. And in the past, it was called cinnamon, which was um, not as stable, but now with the neural um, formulation, it's uh, more stable and it's from Novartis. Uh, it was first um, used in the 70s more for immunosuppression, you know, for organ transplant patients. Uh, but now it's found in a lot of other indications uh, in, in dermatology, but not only in dermatology, but also in other uh, aspects of medicine. Um, so in Singapore, we have the 100 milligrams uh, per minute. We have the syrup version or the suspension. And uh, we also have the 100 milligram tablet as well as the 25 milligram tablet. I think there's a 50 milligram tablet, but we don't have it in Singapore. In terms of the mechanism of action, um, cyclosporin actually um, combines with uh, cyclophilin, all right, and then it becomes active. And what it does is actually um, it, it then combines, uh, it, it inhibits uh, calcine calcineurin. And calcineurin actually induces translocation of this. Uh, NFAT, which is the nucleus, nuclear factor of activated T cells. Um, so if when, when cyclosporin uh, uh, inhibits calcineurin, it actually reduces this uh, NFAT translocation into the nucleus. And uh, NFAT actually induces um, transcription factors for pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-2, IL-2 receptor, IL-4, interferon gamma and TGF beta. And therefore, when we inhibit this, there's a reduction in um, production of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, inhibition of this IL-2 and IL-2 receptor actually leads to reduced T-cell activation, especially the T-helper cells. So in uh, conditions whereby uh, T-cells are very, very active, you know, cyclosporin works very well. In terms of pharmacokinetics, it's uh, mostly or exclusively bound to lipoproteins, so it can be, concentrations can be affected by dietary fat, uh, and it's been shown that raised uh, serum lipid levels can increase cyclosporin uh, body clearance. Uh, higher levels can be seen in, uh, when it's administered before meals rather than after meals, so you may want to ask your patients to take it before so that it works better. Um, the oral bioavailability as well as systemic clearance is controlled by cytochrome P450. And this is important because drugs that can inhibit or induce uh, cytochrome P450 can affect the bioavailability of cyclosporin. So you need to inform, uh, get the pharmacist to inform the patients uh, about these uh, interactions. Uh, it's mostly excreted in bile, but uh, some of it is in urine. So in terms of uh, indications, if you look at most of the guidelines for atopic dermatitis, which is probably, I think, uh, in terms of the use of cyclosporin in pediatrics is probably, you know, the condition that we use the most for. Uh, and you can see that uh, cyclosporin is uh, always uh, in, in there for use in patients with severe uh, atopic dermatitis. And these are the European guidelines for AD in both adults and children. Um, uh, this was from NVIDIA AD, and you can see again that in patients with severe uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, systemic immunosuppressants, namely cyclosporin, methotrexate, 
MMF as well as azathioprine are indicated uh, for severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, this is our Singapore guidelines, which has uh, came out uh, some time ago already, and it's also you know listed as uh, treatment for severe atopic dermatitis uh, together with azathioprine as well as methotrexate. Uh, in terms of comparison between the immunosuppressants, I do find, as uh, Dr. Sanipan has said, that uh, the good thing about cyclosporine is that it works fast compared to the other uh, immunosuppressants such as MTX, isotyperin. So cyclosporine, usually within one to two weeks, if you give a good dose, uh, they respond quite fast. Um, and we can sometimes add on a short course of prednisolone to make it work faster as well. Um, but compared, so compared to MTX and azathioprine and MMF, these usually take about two to three months to work. Uh, so in terms of dosing, um, I start at probably between 3.5 to 4 per kilo per day, and then we divide it into two doses, uh, morning and night. Um, and in terms of side effects, we do uh, monitor for serum creatinine, blood pressure, um, infections and cancer is more for long-term side effects. So I think um, my own tips about using cyclosporine in topic dermatitis is really, you know, to consider the indication, you know, when to start. Of course, you know, in children, we really want to try to um, start uh, systemic medications, especially systemic immunosuppressants, you know, only when they really need it. So generally, I give to patients who are who have unstable, moderate to severe disease with recurrent flares. So you can see that some of these patients that come in with repeated you know, flares, these are the ones that respond quite well to cyclosporine and can bring the flares down quite fast. And then after that, reduce their baseline. Um, if you start metatrexate or azathioprine with these patients, it tends to work you know, uh, slower and then you know, patients will still be getting the flares. So uh, the ideal patient in the topic of is really those that you know, get recurrent flares and they come in with the flare as well. Of course, um, you know, we, we maximize the use of topical therapies first and only if these are you know, suboptimal in terms of the response. And then we also consider starting immunosuppressants. And again, you know, cyclosporine is one of the more common ones that we give. Um, of course, you know, I think that I feel that when we treat pediatric patients, um, subjective uh Subjective scoring is important, uh, whether the atopic dermatitis is affecting the quality of life of patients. Um, there are some patients that have seen, you know, that they may have objectively higher easy or score scores, but when you take their uh, DLQI scores, it's very low. In these patients, sometimes I do reconsider whether I want to start uh, immunosuppressants because if they do get a side effect from it and you know if the child is not very affected by the disease um, they won't be very happy if you know you give them a uh, medication that causes a side effect all right um, so generally those with sort of more chronic thicken like canified plugs um, I do prefer methotrexate or isotyperin I find that uh, in the long term they do respond a little bit better um, but of course, if these are contraindicated, we can give cyclosporin. So I usually initiate between three to four milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, and maximum, usually we um, give up to five. Um, and it responds fast, so within one to three weeks. And I usually combine with oral pregnancy alone for one to two weeks for faster results. Um, so generally, I would treat until there is good response. So once you hit like EZ75 or EZ90, and then we will try to reduce dose. Um, so the most guidelines will say to reduce by 0.5 every three to four weeks. But as Dr. Sanipan had said, um, you know, it's, it's not a hard and fast rule. And generally, I would say, you know, when the patients, um, res uh, I I'll reduce it and then I'll see them maybe about one or two months later. And then if it gets better, maybe uh, reduce it by another 0.5, see them in about one or two months later. And then usually by within a year, um, we try to tail it off or we keep it at a very low dose. Um, of course, when you're tailing and if it recurs, sometimes we do start um, other treatments uh, such as metotrexate, azathioprine, or mycophenolate morphotil. Or now, you know, we give a lot of the pilumab so you can um, um, uh, transition to the pilumab. Just a word of caution um, when starting cyclosporine, when starting metotrexate while patients are cyclosporine, uh, because um, cyclosporine can cause renal impairment. So, um, and MTX is excreted renally. So I've seen patients, especially older patients, where they get some renal impairment and the creatinine is a bit raised when they are cyclosporine or you know, they're a bit uh, dehydrated. And then when you start MTX, you can get MTX toxicity. So just uh, be mindful of that. 
Um, of course, I think very importantly is that we need to discuss with patients as well as their parents, you know, about the treatment of cyclosporine. Uh, some parents would think that it's curative. So we need to emphasize to them that treatment with cyclosporine is not curative for atopic dermatitis and that uh, many of them will st still need to continue topical therapies. But of course, once the disease improves, you can reduce uh, the use of topical therapies, especially topical corticosteroids. Okay, so the next most common indication that we use um, cyclosporine is psoriasis. And I think Dr. Sanipan has shared quite a few cases of psoriasis that he's used in. So Jenny, you can give it for plaque psoriasis, but also for uh, pustular psoriasis or eutrodermic psoriasis. So of course, you know, generally I will give it for patients who have uh, uh, higher PASI scores as well as uh, increased body surface area. Those with very limited plaques, I usually don't consider giving systemic um, drugs. So one very good uh, use of it is actually in pustular psoriasis. Um, in these patients, uh, they come in usually quite sick, so you need something fast to work. Uh, and sometimes I start them both on prednisolone as well as uh, cyclosporine. It brings it down very fast and patients feel much better, but you can't just start steroids on its own uh, because once you tail it off, they flare up again. So you definitely need something that can bridge after you, know, you tail down the steroids over to about two weeks. Uh, I find that another drug that's very, very useful in pastor psoriasis in children is actually acetretin. Uh, in plaque psoriasis, acetretin tends to take a longer time to work, usually a couple of months, but in pastor psoriasis, it can respond quite fast you know, within a few, one or two weeks. So um, between cyclosporine and acetretin, um, sometimes I even start all three with prednisolone if it's very severe, but otherwise um, I would say both acetretin and cyclosporine does have good um, results in pustular psoriasis, especially in children. So again, the dosage between uh, two to five milligrams per kilogram per day, if it's more severe, I do start them on a higher dose. Uh, and as I said, it does work pretty fast for psoriasis, about two to four weeks. Uh, full effects are usually about two months. And again, like in atopic dermatitis, you can slowly taper it according to clinical response as well as side effects. And in during tapering, um, if it recurs, generally you can transition to other agents such as uh, acetretin. So again, usually I would treat up to one year with cyclosporine. I think there is some concern for um, long-term side effects beyond one year, uh, especially on the blood pressure as well as the kidney function. Um, so we see a lot of women patients, uh, pregnant patients in KK Hospital, in my hospital, because we're a women's and children's hospital. And we do see pastor psoriasis in these patients, uh, sometimes moderate to severe plaque psoriasis, which is worsened during pregnancy. And we find that cyclosporine is a very useful drug uh, in pregnancy to use for psoriasis. Of course, now we have the biologics, um, but we still fall back on cyclosporine quite often you know, in our pregnant patients because uh, metotrexate as well as acetretin are both contraindicated. Um, so just some um, uh, notes on other indications that you can give cyclosporine for, but generally, you know, there are other medications that you can treat with for these other conditions, such as uh, articaria. Um, so generally, we use um, other medications. Um, so in CIU, cyclosporine does inhibit IL-4, which uh, is involved in the generation of IgE. So it uh, cyclosporine does cause some uh, uh, inhibition of Ig mediated histamine release from the mast cells. Again, you can give at about three milligrams per kilogram per day, and then slowly uh, reduce it once there's response. And it can respond in two to four weeks, and then after that, you can slowly taper. Uh, however, there's a um, uh, 30 percent relapse rate, which can occur weeks to months after stopping cyclosporine. Um, my tip is that generally most pediatric patients with chronic articaria tend to respond quite well to the uh, updosing of newer generation antihistamine. So I've not had to start cyclosporine in the majority of our patients with chronic articaria. Uh, Dr. Sanipan talked about the use in lichen planus. A few studies uh, in children. Um, there's some use of topical cyclosporine. I think they probably, they probably had to compound it themselves. Um, and for oral LP, so you can use it in the mouth because there's a higher absorption through the mucous membranes compared to the skin. And there's some case reports of the use of um, oral cyclosporine in cutaneous LP. However, I find that um, in LP, metotrexate tends to work better than cyclosporine. And usually in patients with lichen planus, it's not as acute as in psoriasis, pastor psoriasis or or, ex or flaring atopic dermatitis. So generally, um, you can have that sort of lapse of two months before the metotrexate works. But I find you know, that the control is better with metotrexate. Uh, there are a few studies on the use of uh, cyclosporine for LIGO, and hopefully we can discuss this. I mean, I'd like to hear your um, 
your experience with treating the LIGO, but generally like in this paper, it um, use cyclosporin for about 12 weeks and see some repigmentation. Generally, I do find that uh, I use topicals and phototherapy as first-line treatment uh, and most of our patients do respond. Nowadays, of course, we have the new inject inhibitors, both topical and systemic, but uh, I would really like to hear your um, experience with cyclosporin and I go. Um, Dr. Sadipa has spoken about alopecia areata, um, so I won't talk too much on this, but may be useful for rapidly progressing or stable, you know, severe uh, alopecia areata. Um, I think one thing that uh, we've used cyclosporin for more recently is uh, mycoplasma induced rash and lymphocytes, or what we call MIRM, or some people use the term RIME, which is reactive infectious mucocutaneous eruption. So this is um, in the past labeled as erythema multiforme major uh, SGS or on the TN spectrum. So um, they generally present with quite severe mucosal involvement uh, and skin involvement may or may not be present or may or may not be uh, severe. Usually the skin involvement is quite mild and they get more of the mucositis and mucosal involvement. Um, and it can be caused, uh, it was first described by plasma, but now has been shown to be associated with these other infections, usually viral. Uh, there was a paper looking at three patients uh, who were given uh, cyclosporin, three milligrams per kilogram per day, twice daily, so either intravenous or oral, and then maintain for a week and then reduce it over one to two weeks. And they find that the time to cessation of disease progression was at 2.2 days, and time to remission or reactualization is 13 days. Um, so there's some uh, evidence for the use of cyclosporin in children with SGST and on RIME. So this is our own series. I have not published it yet, but soon it will be published. We are trying to get it accepted. So we had seven patients, five with RIME and two with drug-induced SGS, given either IV or oral cyclosporin, 3 to 3.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. Just note that if you're giving IV cyclosporin, the bioavailability is about 10 to 15% more than oral. So usually we uh, give a slightly lower dose if they're giving intravenous um, cyclosporin for some of these patients who cannot take orally. Uh, generally, we maintain it for one week and then we reduce it over the next uh, two weeks. So we treat over about three weeks. Uh, average time to cessation of disease progression is four days. So you can see it actually dries it up quite fast compared to giving um, IVIG. Uh, has been also used uh, case reports of uh, cyclosporin. I think Dr. Sanipan had shared also uh, in other conditions that have um, shown some you know, use, but these are all you know, really novel and, and only single case reports. So it's difficult to say uh, whether it works or not. In terms of side effects, I think the most um, worrying one that we always uh, think of is the uh, renal uh, its effect on the kidney. So the there have been those related decreases in GFR and increase in the serum creatinine, uh, but it can be reversed on this continuation. So we do monitor the creatinine quite closely, especially when we are starting or increasing the dose of um, cyclosporin. The other one that has been quite often reported is hypertension, and we have seen that in some of our patients. Uh, sometimes we reduce the dose and this improves. If not, we might have to... Um, take it off, we might have to stop it and change to another medication. Hyperlipidemia has been described by this is usually seen in the slightly older patients, if not in children. Uh, I do have some patients complaining of uh, gastrointestinal side effects such as nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting. Um, and interestingly, some of them also have neurological symptoms. I've seen this as well, headaches especially, but uh, interestingly, some of them may get tremors. I've not seen seizure or psychosis, um, but sometimes sleep disturbances, I do have some patients uh, um, informing us of that. Uh, you can get uh, elevated liver enzymes and bilirubin at a higher dosage. So usually in the dosages that we give in our skin patients, we don't see that elevated liver enzymes. And of course, you know, we're treating young children. So long term, we really want to think of um, problems with serious infections. Um, of course, non-melanoma skin cancers have been reported. And um, there's this query of association with uh, lymphoproliferative disorder. So definitely, you know, I think in the long term, we really have to think of the risk-benefit ratio, you know, continuing for uh, beyond a few years of treatment. Uh, some of the cutaneous side effects that we've seen, uh, <laughs> hypertrichosis. Um, so, but if you stop the medication early, there, there has to drop. Um, and genital hypoplasia, as Dr. Sanipan said, this can occur in children as well, um, but the risk is not high, but it's important to look out for it and inform patients. Other skin side effects that have been reported include epidemosis, keratosis pilaris. So, vicious hypoplasia, I've seen this mostly in transplant patients on cyclosporin. 
Uh, some of the contraindications, if there's severe active infections, we do, um, uh, it's contraindicated, especially in our region, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, if there's underlying immunosuppression, whether it's primary or secondary, if there's acute or chronic kidney disease, but this is uh, sometimes relative depending on whether it's uh, you can reverse the, the underlying kidney uh, this uh, problem. Uh, uncontrolled hypertension, which is quite rare in children. Uh, relative contraindication is ongoing or past malignancy. Uh, generally, we avoid live vaccines when they are under uh, treatment with cyclosporine, so we try to ensure that they have uh, received all their uh, vaccines before starting on cyclosporine. Uh, this is the pre nation World Cup. I think Dr. Sanpan also talked about this. We'll do an infected screen, such as for hepatitis B and C, HIV, as well as TB. Uh, we usually send off the quantiferon test or TB spot test. Um, some baseline bloods that we do include full blood count, renal panel, and liver panel. Uh, for the larger patients, who, those who are obese and slightly older patients in adolescents, I will also do the testing lipids. And of course, we take the baseline blood pressure. And in terms of regular monitoring, um, we do a renal panel of creatinine. Um, in those over uh, obese patients, we do the fasting lipids as well. Uh, and of course, to monitor the blood pressure. Uh, initially, when we start, I tend to do it sometimes every week or every two weeks. And once we're on a stable dose and patients are quite okay, you can do it every two to three months. Uh, these are some of the drug interactions. Just note that uh, cyclosporine is metabolized by cytochrome P450. So drugs that inhibit hepatic enzyme metabolism can increase cyclosporine concentration. Those that induce hepatic enzyme metabolism uh, can lower cyclosporine concentration. So we do uh, inform patients to look out for some of these medications. And in children, generally, it's the um, infected, uh, the, the antibiotics, antifungals, um, as well as sometimes uh, TB medications as well. Uh, just a word of caution with concomitant phototherapy. So we don't start phototherapy when patients are on cyclosporine because of the theoretical increased risk of skin malignancy. Okay, so in conclusion, I think cyclosporine really has proven its effectiveness in various uh, pediatric dermatosis. And for us, generally, we use it more for atopic dermatitis as well as psoriasis. Uh, the good thing is it tends to work uh, quite fast. So within days or weeks, if you want to make it even faster, you can give a dose of prednisolone as well. Um, but however, because we are treating children and they do have a pretty long runway ahead of them, so we really have to consider the indications as well as contraindications before initiating treatment with cyclosporine. Um, it's used in other dermatosis, not so robust yet, so hopefully we get more data coming out there. However, uh, it is fairly safe, um, especially in children in the short and medium term, uh, but we do still do regular monitoring. We sometimes for some uh, younger children, it may be a problem with the blood taking. So we usually do blood pressure and renal function. Uh, however, I must uh, honestly say that our use of cyclosporine has reduced over the last maybe three to four years due to emergence of newer medications, especially uh, the biologics for eczema and diplomat, as well as now we have the JAK inhibitors. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of uh, promotion. Uh, those of you who would uh, like to join the Asian Society of Pediatric Dermatology, that's our website. Um, we have the RSMPD, which will be in India, and this will be in Delhi uh, between 17th and 19th November this year. So um, do join us if, uh, if you can come to Delhi. Uh, and the ISPD, um, this has, uh, you can get a lot of uh, access to a lot of teaching. Sanipan is, Dr. Sanipan is also one of the um, board members and he's in charge of our mentoring program. So do join. Membership is free for both ISPD and ASPD. So do join us and we'd like to invite you to the next World Congress of Pediatric Dermatology. So the World Congress of Dermatology was in Singapore this year. So in 2025, the World Congress of Pediatric Dermatology will be in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's a long way away, but I'm sure we'll all uh, meet up there for to learn more about pediatric dermatology. Uh, just to say that we also have the Asian Journal of Pediatric Dermatology that has just started. The website has just come up and we hope to get our pediatric dermatology of Asian skin atlas out soon. Dr. Sanipan has contributed some of his photos in there. And that's our pediatric dermatology workshop. If you're interested and with that, I really want to thank you for your uh, um, for, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your <clears throat> as usual, brilliant presentation, I'm particularly bringing up the last few slides about, uh, you know, our International Society of Pediatric Dermatology. Actually, I left it for you because, uh, you know, Mark is the treasurer of uh, International Society of Pediatric Dermatology. Uh, 
and uh, we work together and it is always a pleasure and uh, thank you very much so with this i uh, invite all the panelists i can see uh, dr anand nath dr rahul mahajan <coughs> moderator dr <coughs> maitri panda and dr rajiv sikri could you just switch on your camera please hello dr rajiv welcome you are muted and i hand over the platform to dr maitri for panel discussion there are a good number of questions i found on question answer box uh, some of the questions dr neera can pick up and hand it over to dr maitri thank you so much sir so i'll be sharing my screen uh, yeah so is this visible yeah yeah visible yeah so uh, welcome to this panel discussion on cyclosporin in uh, many and various immunodermatological conditions and uh, all the panelists are a very erudite and elite group so uh, to start with the uh, condition what uh, what we took a home message from okay why is this yeah so what we got to know from the two speakers was their personal experience so basically uh, my um, panel discussion on uh, the round 45 minutes which we have been allotted so it will be basically on the personal experiences and what we actually learn in our day to day practice rather than the guidelines and the consensus uh, statements on all the uh, literature which has already been published however this first slide which we, i have kept is uh, how versatile is cyclosporin as a drug and all these guidelines by the um, uh, european society by the american society and also the british society and also including the indian society whatever the guidelines have always shown this drug as a very very versatile um, and it can be used both in the induction phase also a combination maintenance so it is basically a spectrum of uses in with this molecule Uh, however we'll be discussing on various uh, pertinent topics related to our day to day practice so my question uh, to all, any of the panel member can take up that why the cyclosporine would you prefer rather than some conventional drugs like which we are very comfortable like with methotrexate or a corticosteroid or even for that reason azathioprine and mycophenolate also so why particularly we prefer cyclosporine in your experience i would request any of the panelists who would share their experience with this molecule and what are the most preferred indication they have uh, given in their experience clinical experience in dermatological indications uh, can i go ahead, dr anand here? yes yes sir dr anand please go ahead yeah first thing why no cortic corticosteroids uh, corticosteroids they suppress innate immunity but they actually trigger the adaptive immunity and that's why you see this pustular psoriasis erupting after steroid therapy in many many cases so and also it's like a grenade attack so widespread it's not very specific it just suppresses the immunity doesn't do anything and that's why corticosteroids we do not think anymore as a first line therapy unless we have as dr dar will say when we have our hands nothing else in our hand then we give corticosteroids otherwise i would say look we shouldn't be jumping to steroids straight away in the first case why difference between cyclosporin and methotrexate so first thing mechanism of action is different cyclosporin works on the interleukin 2 and the cd4 cd8 cells and then icam1 expression and that's how it works in psoriasis methotrexate works in the growth cycle in the s phase so it's more a anti proliferative more for a p cell tumors if i look not same as a b cell based diseases so in my mind what i have in any disease or dermatologic condition predominantly mediated by t cell that's why you can see cyclosporin indications at a dermatitis drug reaction sgs everything if you look it is cd4 cd8 or you know it's mediated by that so i would prefer my thought will always think like that cyclosporin for this condition and a b cell mediated diseases like plus what that you have in bullous pemphigus at pemphigus etc where i would prefer methotrexate as the treatment so this is why this is what i can say about cyclosporin methotrexate and steroids in very short so do we do you find comparable safety and efficacy between methotrexate and cyclosporin 
if you prefer cyclosporin sir uh, wherever your your take is on methotrexate do you find the doses and uh, safety and efficacy same or uh, you don't find it comparable not that way as dr sandeepan has already said methotrexate takes 6 to 8 weeks to work it's slow the cyclosporin is fast you have a child with you with severe eczema you are not going to tell the patient, I'll give you methotrexate, it will take time for 10 weeks to work. Okay, we don't we don't use dupilumab initially, but at this present juncture, my first choice would be cyclosporin such a child. As far as safety is concerned, it's entirely how we monitor. We monitor. It's very, very clear. None of these drugs are very safe. None of these drugs are very unsafe. I want to make it very, very clear. It is how we monitor. If you stick to proper guidelines, you will not get into trouble. It's like wearing a helmet. You don't wear a helmet, you will get caught. So you please guys, stick to proper guidelines, note down what is yes, plus and minus for the patient and then start cyclosporin or methotrexate. You will not be in trouble. Sir, Thank you, sir. Dr. Rahul, would you like to share your viewpoints? Yes, uh, sure. Uh, I, I actually very much enjoyed both the presentation, especially by Dr. Mark. Because I think he also brought out a lot of nuances in administration of cyclosporin in various dermat indications. Like, for example, my two topmost two indications would be maybe psoriasis and atopic eczema, and followed perhaps by SAS10. Because it's uh, these conditions where, uh, as Dr. Anand was also pointing out, that one reason that cyclosporin per, in, in certain situations scores over other immunosuppressives is, 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 is because of its anti-inflammatory action, especially the IL-2 inhibition and other things. Same way, uh, so like for, if we say for psoriasis, so I would keep cyclosporin and methotrexate at par with each other in terms of efficacy because even there are studies which have compared the two and they have found them to be almost equally effective. Whereas in atopic eczema, I will, for severe atopic eczema, I'll prefer uh, uh, cyclosporin over methotrexate. But again, I, I'll go back to Dr. Mark's presentation where he said when you are, I think there was a line if I interpreted it correctly, that um, methotrexate can be one of the options if you are going to use it for a very long time and it is moderate to severe. So all the immunosuppressive drugs have their own place in our therapeutic armamentarium. It is just how we individualize the therapy in all these patients. So cyclosporin would be my first choice therapy in severe unstable psoriasis, in severe atopic eczema, in SGS10. So those these will be my top three. Because in other indications like in, say, uh, alopecia areata, severe alopecia areata, or in lichen planus, I generally don't use cyclosporin as the first-line therapy, maybe as a second-line therapy. Uh, but in these indications, severe psoriasis, severe atopic eczema, and it's just in my uh, indications. Um, yeah. this so there be. was a question and, in chat. Yeah, continue, Dr. Mm -hmm. And And again, you can actually uh, justify that based on, because uh, compared to IVIG, compared to oral steroids, it works so much better in SGS10, both in adult as well as in pediatric yeah. population. I agree. I fully agree. Yes. And also the side effect of steroids definitely has uh, been uh, covered by cyclosporin with the use of, uh, so it's a very short course. How long do you use in SGSTN? Generally, it is tapered over 7 to 10 days. We have used in, in a few cases as IV cyclosporin also. Yes. You monitor the blood levels with that and it gives wonderful results in, in those patients. Yes. So another question was there in the chat box, uh, how to taper, uh, I mean, how long to continue in chronic spontaneous arctic area and how do you taper in chronic spontaneous arctic area? So um, uh, Dr. Rajiv, would you like to take up this question? It is there in the chat box. Yes. Uh, the first thing I would like to add to the drug eruption, which uh, uh, the previous uh, panelist has said, I normally use cyclosporin with etanercept single dose in the patients who come with the TEN and SGS. So okay. this is the uh, fastest acting and the safest way to avoid steroid and save the patient. Second, I would say that I use a cyclosporin. I find it's the safest medicine when we use it for the short term because it works on the first stage of the 
uh, T cell activation. So this is the few points I wanted to add. Yes, now, sir. as far as the arctic area is concerned, yes, this works very, very well in arctic area. And yes, in a smaller dose, it can be used for a few months without any side effects. And since we know arctic area can last for years together, and we need to work up the etiology in the background, if we succeed, then it's fine. Otherwise, cyclosporin in low dose, and then as in a pulse therapy, along with the a full dose of the antihistamines. Uh, that sir, is the, what do you mean by low dose, sir? What is your uh, low dose? Like, yes. Uh, instead of using, say, 5 milligram, uh, use a 3 milligram, uh, three milligram, which is on the, yes, 3 milligram, which is sir. on the... Uh, and sir, how sequence. do you taper it in chronic spontaneous arctic area? Yes. Uh, continuously use it for three months at least, and then we shift it to the pulse therapy Saturday, Sunday, along with the antihistamine. Because I know chronic arctic area spontaneous will last. I don't know how long. Okay. So that is how you, uh, Dr. Dhar, would you yes. like to speak on uh, pulse therapy? Because that is also a question in the chat box regarding the pulse therapy use of cyclosporin. So, Pradeepan, sir, would you like to take up this question? Yes, Maitri. I think that's a very relevant question. Uh, pulse therapy of cyclosporine uh, classically been mentioned for uh, controlling of psoriasis and then uh, with uh, daily dose, then maintenance of psoriasis because it reduces the cost, it reduces the adverse effects. A study was published in JAD way back in 2013, 10 years ago. So they started in 21 patients, week and pulse therapy for two consecutive days a week, just like we talk about the mini pulse therapy with steroid, with cyclosporine. And, in, uh, you know, they compared it with daily cyclosporine in those patients for 32 weeks. 32 weeks means eight months. And at the end, the passive score for psoriasis was more or less same for both the groups. So that means pulse cyclosporine is as good as daily cyclosporine for maintenance treatment of chronic or aggressive psoriasis where you initially control it daily cyclosporine then you maintain with pulse therapy. I give pulse In therapy. pulse therapy, do you use a higher dose if you are using for weekend therapy? Yes, I use 5 milligram. 5 milligram. And large. Yeah, I have used up to 7 milligram per, uh, you know, per kg per day. And I would like to, you know, share it to all my colleagues, uh, you know, who have joined, that there is no need of pressing the panic button about the doses, it's a little bit of high dose of cyclosporine. Because you, you, you do remember, please do remember that our nephrologist, hemato-oncologist, transplant physician colleagues, they are using almost three times the dose of cyclosporine what we give. So we are actually using a very small dose, peanut dose of cyclosporine for dermatologic indications. Yes, sir. So and with continuing the discussion, uh, there was another question in the chat box regarding Can use I... of uh, help, uh, use of cyclosporine in lichen planus pigmentosus and oral lichen planus. So, Dr. Dr. Mark, Dr. Uh, Anand wanted to say something. Mahi. Yeah, yeah. Can't, uh, please, Dr. Anand. So, I just wanted to talk about arctic area. Somebody asked how long will you give it. Yes. As sir. Dr. Dar has already said, there are no rules. Nobody has written a book saying you have to give for this long or this long. Okay, we use it because omalizumab is expensive. Simple as that. So I usually give it as 3 milligram per kg body weight for 20 days, then 2 milligram per kg body weight for 20 days, then 1 milligram per kg body for 20 days. Then you put on a weekend treatment like Dr. Rajiv Sekri has already said. But all the while, remember, you come to cyclosporin only fourfold antihistamine does not work. Please understand that. The universal guideline, a fourfold or even fivefold antihistamine is still safer than giving. 3 milligram of cyclosporin. So first patient has to be given fourfold. You cannot wash your hand saying, oh, I am giving fourfold antihistamine. It is dangerous. Antihistamine is not dangerous. You can so, keep but uh, fourfold. fourfold, when you say that if a sedative antihistamine, even with a second generation antihistamine, uh, so sedation is the major issue for working uh, uh, class. And, so, so an uncontrolled we... arctic area, uncontrolled arctic area will never sedate. Please understand. If you have arctic area, you will know you will not sleep. Okay. And the reason you are sleeping is not because of sedation. Actually, you lost your REM sleep for 15 days. After that, if you get relief, you will sleep, madam. That is the whole reason. People, You have to tell the patient that your REM sleep was destroyed for 15 days. Now you are getting a relief in arctic area. 
you are sleeping not because of the sedent second generation anti histamine you are catching up on your rem sleep okay sir so but i beg to differ in this case because many of my patients uh, when i go for a four fold increase the definite concern is uh, sedation sir so uh, i initially always uh, start with uh, wherever there is a duration more than 3 4 months wherever i feel that i can start a cyclosporin or a methotrexate uh, i go up to second fold uh, two fold increase rather than a four fold because of this major concern of sedation sir other than that uh, i know antihistamines are very safe uh, but uh, and any panelist would like to comment on this uh, on use of antihistaminic up to four fold alert and then start cyclosporin uh, four fold is something i trust a lot uh, as far as the sedation is concerned don't be afraid exactly. non sedative yes. give it proper dose four times yeah that's okay i'm that's comfortable right. with that even sometimes i have to add doxepin for yes, those sir. patients who are in big trouble so sir. i don't at least i'm not afraid of that sleeping sir. pattern because i agree with the dr anand that initially the patients are not sleeping for few days and now rather they say thank you doc i could sleep so the house agrees with the use of a higher do- a fourfold increase of antihistamine then go for cyclosporin in case of chronic spontaneous urticaria so coming to the next uh, uh, part of the question uh, do you prefer using the drug in palmoplantar psoriasis and uh, scalp psoriasis would it be your first choice of drug uh, so i would like to ask the question to dr mark yes i think he has left okay i am still here very much oh, yeah <laughs> yeah so I, okay so i think that um uh for Psoriasis, you know, I in children especially, I do try to start with topicals first. So definitely for scalp psoriasis, uh, I do start with topicals first, and really if um, it doesn't work, then I will think of giving systemic treatment. Um, but generally, you know, I think if their scalp psoriasis is quite bad, generally their whole body psoriasis is also quite severe. So in these cases, I think systemic treatment uh, is useful. For palmo plantar psoriasis, also again, uh, topical treatments. Usually, I try that first for children. Um, but if it doesn't respond, then I would then go on to think of systemic treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, same for nail psoriasis. Nail psoriasis usually doesn't respond very well to topical. So, um, but a lot of parents, you know, they they are sometimes concerned about mm-hmm. uh, systemic treatment. So I do um, sometimes put them on a short duration of to- topicals first before. moving them on to systemic when it doesn't work. Um so cyclosporin does work, methotrexate as a treatment also does work for all these and um generally uh if I want fast control I would do cyc- cyclosporin compared to methotrexate and and uh, as a treatment. Of course now we have uh, So when you compare acitretine and cyclosporin sir what would be be your choice of drug in palmoplantar psoriasis? Uh Okay, so generally, if it's flaring quite badly, I do start with cyclosporin first. Sir, because it works faster than acitretin. Yeah. Then you taper, uh, taper off and uh, contain or combine with acitretin, or how do we go forward? So if they have pretty good response to the cyclosporin, I will keep at the optimal dose for a while, get it under control, have at least ninety ninety five percent improvement, and then I'll slowly taper. um while tapering if there is uh, that it's coming back then i will think of transitioning to uh, something more long term so i don't matter track say acetretin or biologic so okay. that's my usual even for eczema i usually do that so you know i i go with cyclosporin first especially if it's uh, you know flaring quite badly and then once you know you get it under control i transition them i i tend to try to take off the cyclosporin by a year of treatment It's my usual practice. Yeah. Any, uh, any other points? Yeah. Interestingly, there is a question: Can we combine scase cyclosporin with acitretin? Actually, if you look in the International Drug Index and you open the interaction, cyclosporin and acitretin have no interaction. That's what it says. But remember, both of them increase the lipids. That's the only thing you have to remember: that both of them can increase the lipids. and acitretin of course will increase the liver enzymes now and we also said dr mark clearly say that even cyclosporin is going to increase the liver enzymes if we give it at a higher dose so 
just going by the book text and saying it doesn't interact doesn't mean anything you probably as he said start cyclosporine and introduce acitretin and slowly probably withdraw the cyclosporine in a long term in a suitable patient knowing fully well what are the adverse reactions of acitretin so mostly sir you prefer the sequential therapy what you are speaking the start uh, with cyclosporine and then switch over to acitretin or methotrexate uh, yes, based but on I, but after listening to dr mark where he says there is a possibility that cyclosporine would have actually reduced the renal function and then methotrexate could potentially is not methotrexate or something else can potentially cause a side effect i think i'll give a little bit of a gap now before i start this medication okay sir sir can i come in my three Sir, yes, you know, sir. I, uh, you know, my question to the person who has asked question, the combination of cyclosporine and methotrexate. I would like to. I'm very curious to know what are the what is the what are the indications where you would like to combine cyclosporine with acetate. I don't find that there are many indications. You know, even for pharmaplantar psoriasis, you give just only acetate. Why you want to call, combine? Uh, you know, cyclosporine. there is a, in fact hardly any indication where you need to combine cyclosporine and methotrexate well you can give sequentially as dr anand was rightly pointed out that you can give sequentially you give initially as it treat later on you give cyclosporine but i don't find any justification why you need to combine these two molecules for what indication yes sir sir uh, here again uh, based on uh, the severity of uh, scoring in atopic dermatitis Uh, would you just decide to start the cyclosporine or any other parameters would you like to consider uh, and sir uh, again one more question which always i have my curiosity is sir if there is a diffuse involvement of in atopic dermatitis only in the form of scaling and maybe uh, thick skin or lichenified skin uh, what will be your prefer uh, preferable drug will it be cyclosporine or when biologics we hardly have a opportunity to use dupilumab so in that scenario sir how do you manage such cases of atopic dermatitis okay uh, uh, maitri let me tell you theoretically we uh, when we write paper or when we do project or studies we always mention about the in easy score or scored and other things but in practice we don't go by all these things honestly speaking when we treat the patient in our chamber and second thing it is the dlqi is something which is very interesting dlqi in children that even if the child has few lesions of psoriasis on the uh, you know atopic dermatitis on the face and the face looks very disfiguring the child is not taken in the school as i shared with all of you so there is a need of cyclosporine to clear those lesions fast so that the child goes can go to the school the child is acceptable accepted in the society here the quality of life is very very important and that only very fast cyclosporine short of biologics cyclosporine can take care of at the same time having said so i must mention that uh, you know uh, cyclosporine is a crisis buster in atopic dermatitis in many patients we give it for short courses to control the disease severity and then we switch over to other alternatives maybe just moisturizer takes care of the rest of the things but uh, you know just for the sake of severity extensive severe as uh, so, you know atopic dermatitis you can give cyclosporine for localized lesions or few lesions it, uh, it it is not probably right if it hampers the quality of life you have to give cyclosporine and nothing works like cyclosporine we all know sort of dupilumab and not everybody can afford dupilumab but cyclosporine is still affordable in our country and its consistency i mean out of 100 patients you can expect with your closed eyes very good response in 85 to 90 uh, you know patients if not more this is this is one thing and second thing you said that extensive scaling and i understand in atopic dermatitis there is no itching means no atopic dermatitis there cannot be smoke without fire there cannot be atopic dermatitis with extensive pruritus sir so best antipruritic for atopic dermatitis is cyclosporine we have to remember that but because it acts through the cytokine level and the pruritus main cause of pruritus one of the cause of pruritus in atopic dermatitis is the cytokines yes sir so, dr rahul would you like to speak something yes yes so so 
so regarding your the question on uh, whether we use the scoring systems and yes that is one way of uh, doing it if you if it is your score art is more than 50 and all those things parameters are there so then obviously the patient becomes eligible or a candidate for uh, systemic therapy in the form of cyclosporine but short of that if that is not achieved uh, based on morphological presentation sometimes what i use is like prurigal eye lesions yes nodular prurigal eye lesions are present there are certain patients who present and especially in our um, indian subtype who may not be having a flexural dermatitis but more of a nodular prurigal eye of presentation in those cases even if they are not satisfying that any fin rica criteria or not satisfying the severity is good of 50 So in those patients, I think systemic cyclosporine, uh, oral cyclosporine, can be one of the options and or a first line option. And regarding your second part of the question regarding uh, a patient or a child having diffuse sort of erythema and some scaling and lichen infiltration, generally before going for oral cyclosporine, what I prefer is a wet wrap therapy with the mild topical steroid. If that fails, then uh, we do offer them. Uh, narrow band phototherapy but uh, the, again that's a problematic option because the patient has to be living in a nearby area otherwise they can't follow up and it doesn't always work so yes for lichenification as sandeepan sir also mentioned it's a good option even if the severity score is not reaching that of uh, severe one you can use short of that also but what i do is a wet wrap therapy as a first bridging thing topical therapy followed by wet wrap therapy followed by maybe systemic and the form of cyclosporine yeah that is a very valid point uh, but it, uh, this wet wrap therapy probably for the eastern part of india will be a little i, uh, I agree i I've, i've heard that from many uh, ex specialists especially yes. in the eastern part that they don't particularly like wet wrap therapy in eastern india so that is because the patient's uh, tolerability issues will be there but uh, but that's a real good option and uh, there was another question regarding the use of uh, cyclosporine in oral lp and how to taper it so anybody would like to take up who are, uh, are you using uh, cyclosporine yes. in oral lp yes yes i i am using uh, i am using a lot and some over last you know 10 years i have been seeing a good number of cases of oral lichen planus even erosive lichen planus i have got more than Eight to ten children who have got erosive lichen planus, which which was which I never thought earlier actually. Uh, erosive lichen planus uh, can occur so much in even in children. So for that erosive lichen planus, oral uh, you know cyclosporine is the best treatment actually. And by and large, they respond very well within three months, three to four months. Then you taper one milligram per kg uh, of body weight for every two weeks and. you know totally take off the oral cyclosporine 6 to 7 months and yes, post treatment follow up has been so far very good i i have not seen many cases of relapse in such patients sir were the patients associated with any metabolic syndrome because oral lp and erosive lp in children sir it is something really interesting yes it is so, interesting because two of them uh, you know their hepatitis c was positive and yes. this is something what we know actually and in Sorry. in 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 the cases case series which i have got yet to be published Sorry. two of these eight children they had uh, you know h hcv positive antibody positive sir thank you so much so uh, my my question to dr mark would it be your first line of drug because you are working in a pediatric hospital so will it be your first line drug in severe pediatric psoriasis or atopic dermatitis i i would so, say uh, you spoke about biologics sir that is the reason why i am asking you uh, in your country do you use uh, this as a first line drug or do you directly go to biologics okay uh yes i i i get asked this uh, quite often so i i think now that biologics are available and they are available in singapore um we have to inform patients and parents that it's available um so what we do especially for ad la so as is we 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 are using quite a bit of the uh, il 17s um so if they fail topical therapies we will present to them you know the next three lines of treatment which would be phototherapy systemic immunosuppressants and biologics i think now that biologics are available we have to present it to them 
And, you know, with our use of the Pinomet over the last four or five years, you know, in terms of efficacy, it's really efficacious. I would say 90, 95% of patients get at least 75% and 90% improvement. In terms of long-term safety, you know, it's also very safe. So if we compare that with, you know, the systemic immunosuppressants um, as a parent as well, I think, you know, if, if it wasn't, a, it of course, wasn't an issue, you know, we, I, most parents nowadays would choose biologics in Singapore. Um, but of course, you know, there are some which still have um, concerns about long-term safety because it's only been around for, you know, a decade or less than a decade. So we don't know the long-term, you know, side effects. And we've already had some psoriasis medications that have been taken off because of, you know, long-term safety. So I think it's important that we present the options to parents. We do tell them the side effects and the efficacy. And it's a joint decision between um, the patient, the parents, and the physician. Sure. So, yeah, I think... So what would be your... Uh, if it is for biologic, sir, for pediatric psoriasis, uh, do you prefer a TNF-alpha or IL-17? Or so, uh, any other neom biologic? Yeah, so now we use more of the IL-17s, but occasionally yes, we may give uh, uh, adenomumab because the biosimilar is uh, available, the MGMeter. Sure. Yeah, so it's either this, uh, this or sakikinumab, or one of the other IL-17s. Yes, sir. Uh, and so yeah, for atopic you... dermatitis, uh, I think dupilumab is your choice of drug. Yeah, uh, it's the only biologic so far now for. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, for the dupilumab, well, we've given more than one hundred and sixty patients since we started about four years ago. Yeah, That's and a I would huge, say huge number, sir. Yeah, ninety to ninety-five percent get amazing results. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's... Nice, sir. Actually, because in India, first, this dupilumab is actually an issue. Whatever patients I have given is through uh, Sandipan, sir, uh, with his guidance. And, sir, cost is a big issue for uh, administering the dupilumab to convince the patient only. And because these uh, insurance and other things are very difficult in Indian setup. So, sir, uh, we hardly get patients who actually agree. And, uh, sir, one more thing regarding this context, sir, do you, whenever you stop a biologic, do you start, uh, do you continue with cyclosporine or any other drug while you stop a biologic? Usually not. Usually I don't have to because... You keep a free period. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, you know, that one year, uh, so, so we usually keep for about nine months sir, to a year. One year follow. Year. Definitely. Thank then, you. Yeah. So uh, go, con continuing with this uh, use in pediatric age group, uh, Dr. Rahul, uh, would you like to uh, share your experience of what is the right age to start cyclosporin and uh, how effective and what actually the precautions should be taken? I don't think there is any load limit uh, for that matter. Uh, and generally, atopics, if you talk about atopics and psoriasis, so, so, uh, infantile psoriasis, they generally tend to present maybe after three to six months only. So it, uh, it's it's absolutely fine to give in in infancy also if you have to if you are taking adequate precautions and monitoring it well enough. So there is there is no major load limit to start cyclosporine. The only thing that you have to uh, do is investigate free cyclosporine properly and then monitor. So BP cuff has to be adequate. The infantile cuff should be there or the age appropriate cuff should be there when if you are monitoring the uh, blood pressure and you should be knowing what are the age specific creatinine values, whether you are monitoring the 25% hike in creatinine or not. Because they, for most of the dermatologists who are seeing adults also, or even for pediatricians also, so we tend to just compare with the normal uh, range that is there in the that is given in the lab report. So, but we have to see is whether the hike in cyclosporine from the baseline is twenty five percent or not. No. So that is important to note, and that holds true for adults also and for pediatrician groups. And again, for dosing also, dosing remains essentially the same. I understand that some of the groups have given cyclosporine ha as high as ten milligrams per kg also especially in severe, in severe psoriasis, but in our experience, we generally don't give beyond 5 mg per kg, and that has served us pretty well, both in atopics as well as in psoriasis, and we have published data on that also, and once we achieve 75% reduction in disease severity, be it PASI, 
uh, in psoriasis or sporad in AD, which tend to start, you tend to start tapering at the rate of one gram per kg. Um, uh, this what was the last? Yeah. Yeah. So this recently what I oh, went through a recent uh, article in JADV, they have suggested the uh, you safety um, uh, age is two years. So any take on that? Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Anand, sir, you are muted. Kind. So sir, like Dr. Rahul told, it is very safe to give even uh, below two years. I mean, he Dr. has uh, even... Dr. Sandeepan has already told me already. When I can use it, <laughs> he has already said he has given it in one. So why then? Uh, why we are getting? Why there we are can, see yeah. a guideline is formed only when there are sufficient number of patients to put it on record and say this many patients were given at one month of age. This is a guideline. Till such a guideline is there, your safety is anecdotal. Very simple. A pediatric case still one year of age when the nephrons are developed. A more than a child which is more than one year old has got at least 30 to 40 percent more nephrons than an adult. Yes, so sir. you need not worry about cyclosporin. It will be very beautifully taken care of by the kidney and there is nothing to worry about as well. And as for the safety study, I think there is a very long study by Christina Gando in somewhere in the Annals of Pediatric Dermatology. 10 years of cyclosporin, they saw a 30 percent reduction in renal function. 10 years and 30%. In These are not children with atopy. These are children with nephrotic syndrome, etc. Higher doses, yes. And see, nephrotic syndrome, kidney is already in a bad shape and still giving cyclosporins. Yeah, just need to take precautions, as Dr. Rahul said. Take the precautions and follow it up. And that's it. I think, as uh, Sandeepan, Dr. Sandeepan has said, I'm now a little more bolder to start it in a younger age. So we definitely require more. Yes. Can I come here? Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Rajiv, please. Uh, I'm very comfortable with cyclosporin in children and in infants because the renal clearance is the best as they are the kids. There has been some publication from Canada where by mistake, the dose given to the infant was 10 times the desirable dose and everybody was panicked. And the documented is that there was no issue because the half-life is just 24 hours. So everything clears very fast. So I would say that using cyclosporin in children is safer than using in adults. So I'm more comfortable and love as the first line treatment in atopic dermatitis in children. And then after the things are under control, then I move to JAK inhibitors. Like people are afraid of using JAK inhibitors in children because rheumatologists have started using it at two years plus age group in, uh, 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 in their cases. So I use even JAK inhibitor at two years plus. So bring the cyclosporin, bring the disease under control, then move on to the JAK as the long-term maintenance. So this yes. is uh, how I manage it. Sir. Uh, Dr. Sandeepan, sir, what is your final take? No, actually, a couple of things I wanted to say. There was a question in the chat uh, chat box when I said that oral lichen planus uh, in children, I have given cyclosporin. And at the same time, I said in two, two children, uh, you know, HCV was positive. So the question was whether you give cyclosporin. No, actually, that was the no. screening. And when HCV became positive, I didn't give them cyclosporine. That was uh, uh, that was something which I wanted to make it very clear. Sir. Second second thing is that as far as the age is concerned, I think it is it is uh, you know amicably been uh, you know made it made clear by my colleagues that no age is bar for cyclosporine. I have given to one month old baby. I told uh, because I have no other option. One month old baby from head to toe, whole body is full of psoriasis. So what to do with this uh, baby? There is nothing in my hand. So, but it cleared within three months. You can't believe it, it the way it responded. You know, cyclosporine response in pediatric age group is far, far better than in adult because of the active nephron, as Dr. Rajiv mentioned, and active nephron, Dr. Anand mentioned. That is very, very true. Second thing, uh, you know, third thing is that, uh, you know, cyclosporine, uh, uh, you know, response, there, there was a question I found in the chat box that, uh, uh, you know, why cyclosporine resistance is seen? It is fact. 
that uh, you know a, a good number of patients in atopic dermatitis there is a resistant substrate of cyclosporin same is true for psoriasis also we have to understand the reason the reason is molecular level uh, you know reason cyclosporin binds to a protein known as cyclophylline cyclophylline is genetically mediated and the name of the gene is peptidyl prodyl isomerase ppia so because of this deficient gene in some individuals there is not enough cyclophylline for the cyclosporin to bind and act so these are the subset of the patients who won't respond to cyclosporin even with adequate dose right so not that all patients will respond equally or all patient will respond. In some patient, it won't simply respond. And this is the reason that why they are not responding to cyclosporin. Yes. Was there any other any other thing you wanted to know? No, sir. This is basically the age to start because when we right. follow guidelines... By and large, by and large as Mark uh, you know, uh, also mentioned very clearly, we have to keep in mind the cutoff value of th three years of age I try my best not to give cyclosporine if there is any other officer available to a child below three years of age <clears throat> because most of the live vaccination is by and large cover, covered below three years of age as per uh, universal immunization program as well as universal uh, you know, vaccination, sch vaccination schedule by our Indian Academy of Pediatrics. Yes, sir. So I think probably this will be the last question we can take up uh, before our time ends. So right. uh, the use of Jackstrat inhibitors in India since uh, a year has been humongous. We all have been uh, very comfortable with this drug. So I would like all of my panelists to, uh, um, what is your experience with the use of this, uh, especially which Jackstrat would you prefer? And do you like to combine or anywhere? Do you uh, um, use it along with cyclosporine or maybe taper cyclosporine and start Jackstrat? Uh, or maybe a sequential therapy. So your take on this uh, aspect. Can I answer? Yes, sir. See, first thing, uh, the present jack stat we're talking about in India is we have very few as of now. Many will come. Right now, tofacitinib is what we are talking about as for dermatology. So also, baricitinib is available. So but dermatology part of it. Baricitinib for alopecia areata. We're talking about mainly tofacitinib. I'll explain yes, to you what is the issue. Sir. Tofacitinib is metabolized by cytochrome P450, CYP3Y934. Okay. Majority yes, of it is maintained. Okay. Cyclosporin is also a substrate for the same P450. Right. So when you're giving these two drugs together, you have to be careful. That is the first very theoretical consideration that you should understand. Both of them. One works a little downstream and one works at this uh, different level. So you have to be careful when you give both of them together. Sir. And I believe in what Dr. Sandeepan said. There is no point giving half-hearted dose of cyclosporin, half-hearted dose of tofacitinib, not having an efficacy at all. It is better struck first like cyclosporin. And then he said there is a subset of patients who do not respond to cyclosporin. For them, I would prefer to do a uh, jack stat inhibitor with due precaution. Here in cyclosporin, you are doing hepatitis B, C, etc. For jack stat, you must rule out tuberculosis in an Indian condition. We are using it very, very heavily in India without taking much precautions. You have to be careful about it. I know I keep telling it in all meetings. I am very, very clear. You have to rule out the latent tuber before you. There was a huge discussion in IAD will acquired forum with no end result on the latent TB. I think we should know that you have to be careful in Indian situation. So in uh, latent TB, sir, uh, are you not uh, initiating Jackstat even if the patient uh, maybe two months of HTT? We are initiating. We had, I think, we had a very huge discussion. There was a discussion sir. saying we should give three months of ATT and then start simultaneously. Start. I have two patients on whom I finished the ATT and started of asnip when they come to psoriatic arthritis, severe psoriatic sir. arthritis. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Rahul? Personally, I don't have any experience of combining the two and I share the concerns by Dr. Anand. Uh, if you look at it uh, from just from the therapeutic point of view, maybe you are with Jack Stratt, you are 
uh, inhibiting an important inflammatory pathway of jackstrad pathway with cyclosporine you are maybe inhibiting the nfk kappa beta pathway yes so in, inhibiting a lot of inflammation and obviously the therapy the FKC should that way increase, but as highlighted by Dr. Anand, it's much more judicious to use one drug in full dose and then see whether the, that drug is giving the efficacy or not. And then shift to, a, if that fails, then shift to a full dose of the other drug and then look for it rather than giving a half-hearted half dose of one and half dose of other. And obviously, we, we talk about uh, uh, tuberculosis and Jackstat inhibitors, but we don't don't talk much about risk of tuberculosis with cyclosporin also, and yes. and that is because as dermatologists we don't see a lot of tuberculosis. We have had years of experience with cyclosporin, but if you see the transplant literature, it definitely does increase because it inhibits IL two. It, yes. it also increases to some extent the risk of tuberculosis. So why to combine the two and increase the risk of tuberculosis in a country where it is rampant? So I would be hesitant in using it as a first and therapy in any of the applications that we have previously discussed. Okay, in a one odd case where everything has failed, it may be justifiable, but not very frequently, I'll say. I so would even love if to you start, you do not combine. You will prefer a yeah. proper dose of each individual drug and let the Correct. drug work. Yes. I have Correct. one patient on I have one patient on tofacity monotherapy, adult atopic dermatitis. Very, very severe. Today, he's very, very happy with just tofacitinib alone. He's done a remarkable... What was the dose, of... sir? Right now, he's on 11 milligrams, the extended release yes, sir. one. And he's doing very, very well. But I've monitored him. He's, we keep to... Has done his quantiferon gold and everything and checked him. Sir. He was the one on cyclosporin too earlier, methotrexate too earlier. But when we stopped everything, waited and gave out of us, we had tremendous improvement. So I'm not okay. sure where we are headed to. Dr. Tandipan will tell us more about that. If that is the yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rajiv, your uh, take on this question. Uh, first, uh, I don't combine these two molecules. I'm very careful. Why to increase the side effects? And you bring the disease under control with cyclosporin and pass on to the uh, JAK inhibitor, which you can use for two years, three years. There is enough data published where the JAK inhibitor has been used for five years consecutively without any issues. All you need to be careful is with the tuberculosis, within tuberculosis. And Dr. Anand has already pointed out on that. So if you are taking enough precautions, I find it is economical, long-term, good maintenance therapy like methotrexate we have been using in the past. Or still, I'm comfortable with that and using that. So I like it. And that too, yes. Jack inhibitor can be combined with methotrexate. It can be combined with aprivillar. So you can uh, use in combination to bring all the things under control. So, and sir, you take, so you want to uh, start initiating individually or uh, would you like uh, with uh, combining with aprivillar or methotrexate? So first, cyclosporine, bring the disease under control, move on to the JAK inhibitor. If the patient is doing very well with the JAK only, why to combine? If there is a something I find it is not getting me the enough results, of course, aprimilast you can combine with any of these uh, molecules or methotrexate, depending upon the uh, patient's age and other uh, parameters. Yes. Thank you, sir. That's a very important point. Uh, so Dr. Sandipan, uh, your uh, take, sir. Uh, you know, uh, I have been giving oral tofacitinib of level use for severe atopic dermatitis, and many many of these patients, most of these patients, ne neither uh, responded to cyclosporine nor to methotrexate, and they cannot afford dupilumab. So I had no other option, and, and our publication, me, Dr. Vishak, there, and Dr. Vijit Sa is al already uh, you know uh, been accepted by a journal, reputed journal. So I have never combined cyclosporine with oral tofacitinib. Ideally, that should not be done because of several reasons, which have already been highlighted. Immunosuppression, it is further adds to the immunosuppression, which we cannot uh, you know, unnecessarily take risk with. That is one thing. However, the, having said so, I must say that uh, there are a case series. There is a case series published in American Journal of Gastroenterologists. This is the gastroenterologist they, uh, they, uh, they published just two years back, 2021, uh, a, a, you know, case series of steroid recalcitrant ulcerative colitis being like, treated yes, successfully with cyclosporine and oral tofacitinib. So there is nothing like, you know, black box warning that you cannot combine. 
but it is to be judiciously done according to the need. For our patients, we don't need to work. Yes, sir. So I went through that article. There was no, there's no dermatological article, sir. That is mm -hmm. for the gastroenter. Yes, sir. Right. I went through. Right. So right. a final take by Dr. Mark Ko, and we'll be winding up this uh, uh, panel discussion. I'll so just add Mark... just one note before that. Yes, yes, sir. Dr. Mark must be wondering why so much tofacitinib is using. Zelzan is very expensive in your country. Tofacitinib is very, very cheap in our country. That's the only reason. <laughs> can I, can I uh, get you to ship some over then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the only, I mean, I, I've given Tofa sitting it before for Lutisha <laughs> Ariata. Um, uh, so I, it, it, some patients do respond to it. Um, I, we have used Bada Sitinib for eczema. So far, um, it's, it looks quite promising. Most of the patients respond pretty well. So I've not had to combine cyclosporin with uh, jack inhibitors. So I think just as a last uh, word, you know, as we are treating children, I think we always need to weigh, you know, the benefits and the cost, whether it's uh, side effects or the actual tree cost of medications. And I think um, we have to be careful when it comes to children. Um, we do a lot of off-label treatment as well, but you know, really consider the indications to start and really um, treat and, and, and also do consider, you know, side effects and long-term side effects. Children have a very long runway. Um, the JAK inhibitors, I mean, I'm still a little bit cautious because, you know, there is long-term risks, theoretical yes, risk for, you know, infections and, and, and cancers. Definitely. So, Sir. yeah. Yeah. So the risk of infections, immunosuppression would definitely stop us from combining two systemic agents wherever it is not necessary. Yes, sir. That's a great take-home message. And uh, one more thing I would like to add that uh, with the advent of topical tofacitinib, uh, I mean, ointment form, which is uh, already approved, we definitely can think of combining a topical tofacitinib ointment or uh, topical use along with the oral uh, systemic immunosuppressive. Correct. So maybe in the next uh, panel or somewhere uh, else, very we can right, have Mochi. this discussion. Yeah, very right. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, my all my panelists. And we had a wonderful uh, discussion on cyclosporin and uh, its use, not to be used, when to be used and how to continue. Uh, so I would like to thank also Biocon Biologics and um, uh, the team of Biocon uh, for giving us this opportunity. And I hand over uh, the session to Dr. Sandipan Dhar, sir. Uh, so thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Maitre. Uh, <clears throat> you have really done a wonderful moderation. As well as yes. all the panelists, they have done full justice. In fact, we had a, one of the most uh, you know, uh, exciting panel discussion on cyclosporine uh, of late, uh, I must say, over the last couple of years. So where all the points, uh, you know, particularly uh, in view of availability of the biologics and jack inhibitors, current position of cyclosporine, everybody expressed their mind and I am sure that all those who have joined, they must have been benefited, including us, at least me. Uh, I must take this opportunity to sincerely thank, uh, you know, Dr. Mark Ko, uh, our international speaker. Thank you very much, Mark. Mark is the board of director, uh, you know, of International Society of Pediatric Dermatology, as well as Treasurer, I told you, a very big guy, right? So uh, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, you. sincere thanks to Dr. Rajiv Sikri, Dr. Anand Nott, uh, Dr. Rahul Mahajan, you know, our uh, uh, current uh, uh, most happening pediatric dermatologist, I must say, and, uh, and the uh, 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 Dr. Maitri Panda, another one, you know, current happening pediatric dermatologist, they too are actually, uh, 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 you know, um, enriching our uh, IADVL SIG pediatric dermatology uh, segment. Thank you very much to all of you. And on behalf of uh, entire SES team, I sincerely thank all the participants today. I take this opportunity to sincerely thank Team Biocon Biologics, Dr. Neera for uh, uh, you know, introducing the speakers and Mr. Varun and the entire team of Biocon Biologics. And please stay tuned for our next international speaker program of SES on 6th of August with Dr. Kasten Floor from London. Thank you very much.
Good Thank night, you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.